our hearts for this time of worship. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 71. It's verses 1 and 2. If you'll respond with the bold print on the screen or there in your bulletin. In You, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In Your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline Your ear to me and save me. Let us continue to worship God as we sing together our opening hymn. Come, Christians, join to sing.
And as you're being seated, I'm going to invite uh, Charles and Jane Rose up here to the, the front. And they're first year friends. I have you guys stand over here. We have a, a new ministry called First Year Friends. It's part of our nurture team. And so uh, these wonderful people have committed to be their first year friends through this first year and getting to know kind of the ins and the outs of what it means to be members here at Oak Ridge United Methodist Church. And if you grew up here, you kind of know what goes on and from one month or one week to the next in different seasons of the church. And so uh, what a great way of uh, offering first year friends. And so uh, the interesting part of me being appointed here to Oak Ridge United Methodist Church is because of these two people. Uh, it was several months ago that they said, uh, Mike, we are moving from Mount Holly uh, to be closer to our children and grandchildren. And I said, okay. And then I get a call in October and I said, you know, um, there's this church up in Oak Ridge that we want you to think and pray about. And so once I wrestled with God and I've shared about that and said yes, I called uh, Jane and Charles one day because the membership secretary, Steve Painter down at Mount Holly said, hey, I think that's in the area of where Jane and Charles um, Rose moved to. And I said, really? I said, I don't think so. He says, we'll give them a call. So I called them, and I said, hey, have you guys found a church yet? And they said, no. And I said, well, have you ever heard of Oak Ridge United Methodist Church? And they said, well, yeah, we're driving by the church right now. <laughs> and so they pull into the parking lot and says, wow, this is a, a big church. It has a big parking lot, a lot of buildings and everything. He says, do you know the pastor there? And I said, well, I kind of know the pastor who's there, but I, I really know the pastor who's coming there. <laughs> and at that moment, I think Jane says, I have chills, because are you getting ready to be reappointed to Oak Ridge United Methodist Church? And I said, I am, but do not tell anyone. <laughs> and so uh, they said, great, we're going to join that church on your first Sunday. Now, it's not my first Sunday, but at least it's my first month. And so we are grateful to have Jane and Charles Rose joining our church family. They have such wonderful gifts and talents, and they'll be willing to share with this church. And so as much as we uh, will be a blessing to them to be a part of our church family, they will be a blessing to us. And so they've already been baptized. They've already professed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so I just need to ask them the two uh, simple questions. It seems simple, but has a lot of weight to And then you have a response as well. So for you, uh, Jane and Charles... As members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church? Do all in your power to strengthen its ministries. If so, say, I will. As members of this congregation of Oak Ridge United Methodist Church, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by offering your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. Members of the household of God, I commend these two wonderful people to your love and care, and I ask that you do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love, if you will respond. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit that you may live in grace and peace. And I don't know if uh, Jane or Charles wants to share anything more uh, with the church family. Yeah, please. I think I know how to do that. Is it on? It is on. We just want to thank you for being a welcoming church, and we look forward to meeting all of you. And uh, it felt very good to check off the member on the book this morning <laughs> instead of guess. So, you have anything? No. No. Let's give God praise for our new brother and sister in Christ. Thank you so much. As we give God praise for both Jane and Charles being part of our church family, I also want to let you know in the uh, service at 11 o'clock, Kelly.
Kaylee will be transferring her membership uh, to our church family, and then Mia will become a baptized member, or kind of the old school, a preparatory member, that whenever she gets to the age to go through confirmation, uh, to confirm her baptism, and maybe God would lay it on her heart and soul to choose to accept Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, which if you've met Mia, I think she's already done that uh, at her age of seven, and so she continues to live with that love of Jesus Some prayers that we need to be lifting up. I've shared uh, out on our Facebook group about uh, Beth Kingsbury. She fell yesterday at her house on some ice. She was going shopping with her daughter. Uh, She sent me a text message this morning and says, uh, I slept better than I thought I would. Uh, It only hurts when I move it. (laughs) And so we pray for stability with that shoulder. They'll plan on having a doctor's appointment sometime this week. They're hoping on Monday to find out if they have to have surgery or if the shoulder will heal on its own. So keep uh, Beth and Steve in your prayers. Brian Ainsworth is still on the ventilator. I got to visit with him this week in ICU. He's no longer in isolation dealing with COVID, uh, but he still has a lot of medical hurdles to get over. And so Tracy, his wife, continues to be up there, continues to be an advocate uh, for him. They had to shock his heart into rhythm this week, and we're praying over his kidneys. Uh, There's a little bit of a kidney stone Uh, and some other issues that he is fighting with some fluid on his body. So we're praying uh, for miracles and uh, baby steps, and we just want to continue to lift them up in prayer. We had the service yesterday for Jackie Myers family. We had to move into the sanctuary. As you know, it was a little cold outside. Even for the five minutes, we were at their graveside. So keep Phil and Jamie and the whole family in your prayers uh, for them. And Meredith uh, Dula is still recovering from her surgery. Uh, She sent me a message this morning and says that she's doing... Uh, better each day, still a lot of uh, pain and still a lot of swelling, but getting better and better each day. We lift up John Rollins, recovering from his back surgery, and uh, Casey Witt, our contemporary worship leader, her aunt is still in the hospital with COVID, and uh, also let you know uh, Casey tested positive for COVID this week, and so she's not going to be at our 11 o'clock service, so continue to pray for her. She's getting better, uh, but just, uh, you know, testing positive, she can't be here with us. And I know there's many, many unspoken prayers, and maybe you have prayers that you would like to have us lift up, or maybe not spoken out loud. Please let me know. Uh, Contact me. Let me know about any prayers that you may have. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you and we praise you for the glory of this day and even the cold weather outside. We are so grateful to come into a warm sanctuary, to be gathered together with our church family, to look from one pew to the next, and to know that we are surrounded with such a great witness and a faith that is focused on you, Jesus. For those that are worshiping with us online, it is amazing how the power of God through the Holy Spirit can connect each and every one of us. May we find ways to be your hands and your feet, and Lord, make your presence known to our shut-ins, those in the nursing home, especially those in the hospital and those that are at home recovering from a fall or surgery. God, offer your healing touch upon them. Allow us to understand how amazing your grace is for us. That there's nothing that we can do to deserve it. And that we begin to understand the immeasurable love that you have for us. And that you know us by name. Your love for us even extends to knowing how many pieces of hair are on our head. And that you know the ups, the downs, the twists and the turns. You know every single person here today through the walks of life that you've been going through. Because you love us with an agape kind of love. It is unconditional and immeasurable. May we experience that love here today through the music, through the word that is proclaimed. And may that love enter into our heart and our soul. So we begin to see how you, God, are at work in us and at work in this world. And now may we, as brothers and sisters in Christ, a part of this church family, the body of Christ, redeemed in your blood, where you showed your love upon that cross. May we join our voices together to pray the prayer that Jesus taught his own disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory 
forever and ever. Amen. Now I'm going to invite Harrison and uh, one of our youth. Last weekend, the youth went to Resurrection Retreat, and we wanted to have them share about that experience here with you this morning. Hey, good morning, everybody. A um, little background for you all on the retreat that we went to last weekend, Resurrection. It's a uh, United Methodist retreat for United Me- well, students of all denominations, really, but it's put on by the United Methodist Church, uh, mostly based in Holston Conference, where um, I came from. So I kind of grew up going to that conference as a high schooler and then taking my youth groups where um, I worked in Tennessee there, but um, groups from North Carolina all the way up to northern Kentucky, um, northern Virginia. I think there was a group from Mississippi that was there. Um, It's actually the largest gathering of Methodist youth in the entire country, um, which is a pretty cool thing. And um, we obviously, we weren't able to have it last year because of COVID. So this was a really special year that we were able to do it. And it's just a really impactful thing. There was about 3,600, 3,500 students that were there. It's normally 12,000. So um, this was a lot less than it had been in the past. But the way that they kind of social distance and spread all the groups out among the place, it really kind of felt, did you think so? Yeah, it kind of felt like they were, we were there with just tons of people worshiping, and I feel like in a safe way. And uh, I just want to thank our church um, for being so supportive of our group and doing things like this and for really helping us be where, the youth be where we're at today. Um, because well, two, two years ago when we, two years ago, yeah, two years ago, after we came back from resurrection, we had we had all grown so much, I think, and and we had really hit a um, we really hit a really cool stride where there was a lot of students making some really important decisions um, about their futures and just a lot of stuff for us to work on. And then boom, COVID happened. We had to change everything we were doing. We kind of we didn't lose our way. We really worked really hard to stay connected. But we're so blessed that now after this event. Um, with a supporting church and allowing us to, to move and meet and, and our group be actually numbers wise, not that that matters, but stronger than it's, than it was before COVID, we're able to really build on a, a retreat weekend like this. So we, we're gonna, you're going to hear from some students um, over the next couple weeks with some personal testimony. Um, we had about four, we have four, not about, we have four um, of our girls that made um, bona fide, heartfelt, first time decisions of faith. Um, and it's just been really a joy to talk to them. Um, a couple or one has been in our confirmation class um, and as a high schooler and wanted to learn and learn and learn and has really just put this, this stuff together. So we're, we're going to try to get a lot of those stories out to you guys too in different ways. Um, through social media, through the, the newsletter, and maybe some other people talking. But Ella, who's one of our um, uh, greatest student leaders and, and very involved with everything that we have going on, um, has graciously stepped up to share um, in both services today about her experience. So I was going to ask her a couple questions. <clears throat> um, one, oh, let me ask you. You want to hold this, and I'll ask you that word. Okay. So Ella, how many resurrections have you been to? I have been... Wait, hold on. <laughs> I've been um, coming to Resurrection since I was in ninth grade. So minus the year that we had off last year, I've been to Resurrection three times. How would you say over the years it's impacted you in your walk with Christ? Um, it was definitely the first time I went. It was a very new experience. There was a lot of people there, and it was I was kind of like, wow, this is a very new thing that I've never experienced before. But... Um, It's definitely just every time it's a chance to grow closer to people that I've known and developed relationships through youth group with already. Um, And it's also a chance to get to know new people um, within our church and then sometimes even outside of our church when people bring guests. Um, So it's a great way to just build up uh, like a network of support and um, just meeting like like like-minded youth um, and people in our community and also just every year, the speaker and the band and whatever message they have to share and whatever the music the band plays, it's just very impactful. And every year, I feel like I get something new out of it. Um. It's definitely inspired me to get more involved with the youth group. I have been 
a part of the student leadership team here since eighth grade, but continuing to develop those relationships with youth my age and then youth that are younger than me um, has definitely inspired me to get more involved um, and by developing those relationships with people younger than me um, has inspired me to kind of try to encourage them more and stay involved in their lives as well. Um, well, it was a very uh, welcome chance to just kind of reconnect with people because uh, we've been doing youth and stuff regularly, even though COVID happened. But this is kind of like our first like big event um, back to how we would have done it um, before COVID hit. So it was a great chance to just reconnect with people, but also just on a more uh, spiritual level. Um, one thing that was particularly impactful, um, the speaker's um, message on Saturday night um, was about um, the prodigal son, which was a story I've heard over and over and over again in my years at church and my years in Sunday school and youth group. But the speaker said something that was actually like, I have it written down in like three places now, just because it stuck out to me so much. But in the spot, uh, in the place in the story where um, the prodigal son is returning home to his father, the speaker said that in the same way, and the son is like kind of rehearsing what he's going to say and how he's going to act, and the speaker said that um, God wants us to stop rehearsing our speeches and just come home, um, which was something that was very impactful to me um, because it's like we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to have it all together to come before God. Um, so it's just that was something specific. Uh, especially impactful for me this year, but it's like every year there's something like that that can impact people and something different impacts every person about the weekend, so. Appreciate that. And I'll brag on Ella and a lot of our <clears throat> student leaders because not only um, with the connecting with other people part and being there and being present at youth, they've, they've been very uh, direct about their, their leadership spiritually. They've been very, um, and really I think it's been fed from this retreat and other ones like that, where they've intent, been intentional about the questions they ask the other students, um, about talking about what God is doing in their life, just real, real stuff. And it's just a pleasure to be a part of a group that does that. I'll say, too, um, just to give God some praise and just to show how much he continues to amaze me. For whatever reason, every mission trip and retreat that we've been to since, like, last summer had the prodigal son story. And I'm like, okay, my guys are pretty smart. I mean, they've, they, they've got this by now. Like, let's do something else, right? Maybe this is the milk. We need some meat or whatever. But God, in his... In his um, ultimate brilliance has always brought out something new. Same with Ella. I was like, okay, we know the prodigal son. We've talked about this a bunch. And there's always something new that's come from that. And one thing um, uh, in general that our group, I think, really got was the idea of laying our burdens down and, 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 and dropping our burdens and, and allowing God to, to um, let us live this life, this grace-filled life with him. And that was something that was kind of a key theme and really meant a lot to me, too. So really appreciate your support of our group and, and, and helping us go to things like this. Um, it's making a huge difference in a lot of people's lives, and that is in turn making a big difference in others' lives. So thank you. Thank you. 
seated. And as you're being seated, we invite the children to come down for our children's time as we all sing Jesus Loves Me. Good morning. How are you? You look very pretty today. So I have been working on my recipe for chocolate chip cookies, okay? So I brought some cookie dough, all right? So I put things in there like flour and sugar and eggs and vanilla, and I want to make really, really, really good chocolate chip cookies, but will you look in there and tell me if it looks like something might be missing? What do you not see in there? Chocolate chip. Tell, say it again. Chocolate chip. It's hard for me to make chocolate chip cookies without chocolate chips, right? I mean, I could put eggs and flour in there, but without chocolate chips. Do I have chocolate chip cookies? No. Okay, what if I put uh, vanilla and milk in there, but no chocolate chips? Do I have chocolate chip cookies? No, that's ridiculous, isn't it? I can't make chocolate chip cookies without chocolate chips, can I? Do you like chocolate chip cookies? Yeah, okay, good, good to know. That's going to be important in just a little bit. So I want to switch gears and talk about something else when we're talking about ingredients. Do you ever help mommy cook at home? Do you like to cook? I do too. But we have to have the right ingredients, right? Just like I can't make my chocolate chip cookies without chocolate chips. That would be silly, right? In the Bible, there's a story where Jesus, excuse me, where Paul is talking about all the things, all the ingredients that we need to have a Christian life. And he tells us that one is the most important. It's kind of like the chocolate chips of the Christian life. Can you get, oh, here comes one of my buddies. I think you know this guy. Get down here with us. I missed you. We're talking about chocolate chip cookies. But look inside. What's missing? Chocolate. chocolate chips. It's ridiculous, isn't it? In the scripture that we're going to talk about today, that Pastor Mike's going to talk about, it tells us that the most important ingredient for the Christian life is love. Love. You know, we can come to church every Sunday and we can learn Bible verses, but we've got to love each other. It's important, right? It's not always easy. But the Bible tells us that it is so important for us to love each other, to be good to each other, to show God's love to others. It's good to share. You know what? Sharing shows God's love. I'm getting... that. You're, it's caring. Sharing is caring. You're right. And if, and if somebody wants to have that toy, you can't just snatch it from them. Such a good lesson. I should just give you guys the microphone. You're so good at this. That's right. You guys gave good examples of showing love. Now, I'm going to share with you guys in just a few minutes too, okay? All right, we're going to pray now. Lord, I thank you for these children and for this reminder that love is an important ingredient in the Christian life. Help us as adults to be good examples of that. And Lord, instill that in these children, that they know that your love is important to them and that they show it to others. In your name I pray, amen. Now, you know how I told you I wanted to share with you all of this talk about chocolate chip cookies. What do you think I might have for you? Now, don't tell the adults. They may get jealous, but I have you guys some chocolate chip cookies. Come here. There's you some chocolate chip cookies, and there's you some chocolate chip cookies, and you may go back to your seat. We're all children of God. <laughs> so as you're leaving church today, meet Larissa out at the door. 
to, for your bag of, uh, we'll probably have to open up the bag and send those out. Wouldn't that be communion? We would have the block for communion Sunday for chocolate chip cookies. Chocolate chip cookies, as Kelly jokes about my grandmother, got love that no one could even match it. But Kelly would joke that she didn't have enough chocolate chip cookies in her chocolate chip cookies. And uh, she raised my brother and I and just, I mean, it just was amazing. So I look at my wife like, don't even go there. Don't, don't even criticize my grandmother. You, you can do whatever you want. That's just that's one of the no's. But we joke about how much dough there was in ratio to chocolate chip cookies. And so, uh, funny enough, they were making in the he needs more chocolate chip And that also relates to we need more of God's love. Our scripture passage this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's verses 1 through 8 and then just verse 13. This is the new international version I'm reading, the NIV. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Let us pray. Desire this word and your love like we desire. to hear you speak growing in our relationship, hear you calling us to grow in that relationship through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth upon you, for we you in Jesus' name. Amen. That scripture passage is one that you probably hear read a lot at weddings. It's a great wedding scripture passage and love and you start to wonder what kind of love is this and where did you learn about your understanding of love? Maybe it was from your parents. You saw the love that your parents had and maybe you saw love in aspects of movies and music and all these things that this world... Maybe it's through relationships that you learn from other people. Is my wireless mic not working? Oh, good. Is that even better? Okay. Yeah, I know people are online posting going, I can't hear Pastor Mike. Do I need to read the whole scripture over again? So those that are online, you'll have to read 1 Corinthians 1 through 8, verse 13, all by yourself. It actually might be good for all of us to read over it. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this scripture passage, there was a study I was doing, I can't remember what it was, but it told us in the study, take the word love out and put your name in it. Maybe you've done a study like that. And it's interesting when you read it especially verses 4 through 7. It sounds like this, which is definitely not 100% true. So I'm asking for God's grace to start with. Mike is patient. Mike is kind. Mike does not have any envy. He does not boast. Mike is not proud. Mike is not rude. Mike is not self-seeking. Mike is not easily angered. Please do not ask my wife about any of this. It'll be interesting to read this when I get to the other service with her being in there. 
Mike keeps no record of wrongs. Mike does not delight in evil. But Mike rejoices with the truth. Mike always protects. He always trusts. He always hopes. He always perseveres. Now it says love never fails. But more times than not, Mike fails. And that's where God's grace comes in. And so when we hear our understanding of love, I don't know if you know this or not, but in the Greek language, there are four different words used for love. Now, we use love on kind of all different kinds of levels. You remember when you're in elementary school and you're like, I love pizza. That when you went to school and pizza was on the menu, I'm like, I love pizza. As a kid, we used to always respond with, well, why don't you marry it? If you love pizza so much, could you imagine? Take this pepperoni to be your wife, and this pepperoni pizza will now become one in your stomach, right? You're not marrying the pizza, but you might love it. And there's things out there. I mean, I love sports, and I love all these different things that are of this world. And that's not the kind of love that Paul is talking about. So the four different uh, words in Greek about love is philio. That's one of them. Now, interesting enough, there's a city known as Philadelphia Pennsylvania. And it has the word philia in there, right? What is the Philadelphia city known as? The city of brotherly love. And philio relates to brotherly love, friendship love. It's a love that we relate to our community of a philio, that kind of love. Now, the other one is eros. Eros is pronounced in a way of relationship love between a husband and a wife. It's a special love that God gives, especially for marriage, that the two are no longer two separate people, but in marriage, they what? They become one. The other one is sturge, which is empathy, having love or an empathy for another person, to have a special bond with another person. That one is not used as much but then the last one, the fourth one, is the one we're going to be talking about today is agape love. An unconditional love. Agape love that God has and is emphasized in John 3.16. For God so loved the world, agape love the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That unconditional love. But the movies and uh, music and growing up watching MTV and all these different things on TV give you a bad representation of the love that God wants to have with us, or even the Eros love when it relates to our relationships. I remember this in seventh grade, and interesting enough, just recently, Meatloaf died. I don't know, some of you are like, I have no idea. What do you mean, Meatloaf died? We're having Meatloaf for dinner, it didn't die. There was a, a singer known as Meatloaf, and he sang one of his favorite songs was, I will do anything for love, but I won't do that. I have that on tape. As we were moving, I was going through a box, and there was a shoebox of tapes. And some of the people out there going, what are tapes? You know, what are even CDs? But it's a cassette tape that I played and rewound at least 70 times. Because it was Christina and I song in seventh grade. Yes, I still remember that relationship. Because Christina broke my heart into a million pieces. She says, I don't want to date you anymore. And she just broke my heart. And I remember in my bedroom listening to that tape. Play, rewind, play, rewind, play, rewind. And my eyes are just pouring down all these tears of sadness. And my dad comes into the room. He's not a, a kind of a, a feeling kind of guy. But that night he was. And he came into the room and says, so Mike... How many girlfriends have you had so far in your life? I was like counting through them. And after a couple minutes of counting, I was like probably 20 girlfriends by seventh grade, you know. And every single one of them broke up with me. I didn't break up with them. And he says, Mike, you're probably going to have 20 more. But at that moment, you don't want to hear 20 more. You're like, that one, she broke my heart. Now, I'm not sure what meatloaf meant when he says, I will do anything for love, but I won't do that. I'm not sure what that was. But at that moment, you have that feeling of putting all your eggs in that one basket. And you're like, I will do anything to get her to love me. Now, you would think that 
That would have been the end of Mike. He's not ever going to love again. Your heart is broken into a million pieces. But God has a way of allowing us to forget that and begin to heal and move on. And then you start dating someone else. But I remember in high school that I was dating this one girl that truly broke every single part of me into a million pieces that I asked this question. If she can't love me, then I don't think anyone else will. You see how you get so fixated on this relationship that your entire self is connected to that love. Not beginning to understand that God loves you or that your family loves you. You're so narrowly focused in this snow globe of love that you're going, my life has come to an end because she, or in some cases, the girls in here, that he doesn't love you anymore and that your value is nothing. It's because we have this society understanding of love. We're so focused on this eros love that we don't even begin to understand later on in life that whenever God joins you together as husband and wife, that love in a marriage is God's wedding gift to the married couple. Do you ever think about that? That when two people are joined together, all the family and friends bring wedding gifts. The wedding gift that God gives is this uniting at the end of verse 13. Faith, hope, and love. They're intertwined like a tight rope. And sometimes I'll say, well, the husband, that he represents faith. The wife represents hope. But God is the love that intertwines them together to no longer ever be separated. And you've seen the, uh, the unity candle, or maybe you've seen the tying of a knot, right? And taking those three strands and tying them together. It's a beautiful representation of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. And that knot should never, ever be separated. Just like the two candles representing them as individuals would be united together as one. How do you divide that flame ever again? You can't. And some people do sand and mixing of sand and all those type of things. But uniting together as one is that eros love. But when you're focusing on love of pizza or love of that girlfriend or love of that spouse... Nothing comes close to the love of agape love that God has with us. It's a love that we have a hard time understanding it. And a little glimpse of that love are those who are parents out there. That you would do anything for your children. And that you love them unconditionally. You might not ever want to tell this to your kids. But you're like, there's nothing that you could do to ever stop you from loving them. I didn't understand what that love was like until someone uh, says, like, you know what it's like to be a parent? No, I don't. And then Mia came into the world. And to hold your own child in your arms, it's a life-changing experience. And you're like, I never thought I could love something, someone so much. I love Kelly. But the uniting us together in marriage and the blessing that God's given us with Mia is absolutely amazing. And when I look at Mia, I'm like, my heart melts. If whatever she wants, yes, you can have it. Yes, you can have it. And we spoil our kids rotten sometimes. But sometimes the best way you can love them is not by saying yes, but by saying what? No is okay. Same thing with God. God looks at us and he wants to spoil us rotten. He wants to love us and care for us, give us all the blessings that we need and we deserve and blessings that we don't even need and we deserve. He wants to bless us with. But sometimes God says no. In order to love us. To say, listen, Mike, you don't need that right now. Mike, you don't need to open that door. You think that you're ready for it, but you're not ready for it. I know what's best for you. Just like our parents know what's best for us. And in this understanding of love, Paul is trying to get to us to understand that there's something deeper than just saying, I love you. I think sometimes people just say it without meaning. Every time we go to bed at night, hey, I love you. Before I leave the house, before Mia goes to school and when Kelly was going to work was, I love you. No one ever left the house without saying, I love you. And I do that with my family and conversations because you never know if that's going to ever be the last conversation you have with them. So you kind of staple it with, I love you. You know I love you. You love me. We're good. We might not all agree on everything, but we are still with a love that is rooted in the love of Christ. Now, this love of Jesus that's unconditional and immeasurable, someone asked God, how much do you love me? Does God love you this much? You know, you used to play that game, you know, maybe in a relationship with your family, your kids, or even in my family. We, my brother and I try to figure out who's the favorite, and we do that with my mom. 
I was talking to my mom this week on her phone, and the house phone rang, and my brother was calling her. And she says, hey, Matt, I'll have to call you back, and just hung up. And I said, well, why didn't you tell him that you were talking to your favorite son? She goes, you know, Mike, I can't do that. I was like, I know the truth. You just don't need to say it. I know that I'm the favorite. And Matt and I play back and forth with that. There is no favoritism between my parents and my brother and I. It's that they love us unconditionally. Same thing with God. God doesn't love one person more than the other. He loves us all unconditionally and immeasurably with that love of his son, Jesus. And the measure of his love for you is measured by this cross. And Jesus put his hands out on that cross. He didn't turn his hands in to kind of end the measurement. Just as much as God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and grows with infinity, then if God is Alpha and Omega, the same thing is for his love for you is the Alpha and the Omega. His beginning is rooted in his love, and even his end is rooted in love. And his love is signified by that cross. Now here's the thing. God did not come up with the crucifixion himself. Where did the crucifixion come from? Us. It was us. Humanity coming up with something awful and terrible to show others, hey, if you do something wrong, that's how you're going to end up. And God takes something, something awful and terrible and makes something that we look at it today and say, isn't that beautiful? How God turns something awful and terrible and makes something beautiful out of it. This is signifying to us that if you speak in tongues, you're just a resounding gong without love. You sound like the parents on the Charlie Brown show. Wah, 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 wah. That's what you sound like if you don't have love. The same thing is this, is that if you're talking and you're not living out those actions with others, To put your name in there every time it says love really puts a mirror up to our soul, does it not? It makes us look at saying, is is my life, does it show patience? Does it show kindness? Am I showing envy for others? Am I boastful? Am I proud? Or am I rude sometimes? Sometimes I'm self-seeking. Sometimes I get easily angered. Sometimes I am keeping track of wrongs and keeping records of wrongs. We do that in marriages, don't we? Do you remember that one time you did that? I tell people in marriage counseling and pre-marriage counseling, you should not keep bullets on the belt. There's records of wrongs of bullets so that whenever you get into a fight, it looks like the OK Corral. You start bringing up things from 5, 10, 15 years ago, and you're just shooting back at each other. I'm going, that's not love. Could you imagine the the conversation you have with God about bringing up everything from our past? But when God looks at us in a time of trial or our lives, and we, we know the sins that we've committed, do you know what God says to us as we're covered in the blood of Jesus? God says, what sin? What sin? Because he loves us. He loves each and every one of us. And that he wants us to live out this love that the scripture passage continues to reflect. And love never fails. The agape, unconditional, immeasurable love. There's nothing you can do to separate your relationship between you and Jesus. There's nothing you can do. God will always love you. No matter how far you run from him. No matter how many times you turn your back on him. No matter how many things you put between you and God. And you put God at the bottom of your priority list. Or even if you delete him from your priorities. God still loves you. And there's always hope. Because love never what? Never fails. It never fails. So how can we receive that love here today? In a new and special way. Because I'm hoping and praying that if you're here today, you know about that love. And that love is different than the kind of love the world offers. It's different than what Meatloaf was talking about. I will do anything for love, but I won't do that. Thanks be to God, God never said that. God says, I will do anything for love for you that I'm willing to give up my only son for you. I will do anything to come running after you. And I believe he's knocking on the doors of hearts to people that are hardened in their heart, hardened in their faith, who I've talked to on a regular basis as a pastor who say, Pastor Mike, I don't even love myself. 
for what I've done. There's no way God can love me. And I said, well, if God doesn't love you, then he doesn't love me either. Oh, no, he loves you. He just doesn't love me. And I'm telling you, I've tried to say it over and over again, going, God's love never fails. God's love is absolute. His grace is amazing because there's nothing you can do to deserve it. All you have to do is open up your heart, the doors to your heart, and say, Jesus, I don't understand this. I'm just going to open my heart and have faith and belief that you love me. That you can take all these millions of pieces of my heart broken, feeling like I'm nothing and I'm useless. There's no way anything good can come out of my life because of my past, of things that have happened to me, things that I've done, that I'm so ashamed I can't even begin to say them out loud. But they haunt people. They carry this baggage around, feeling like there's no way God could love them. And maybe you are the messenger that God wants to send to them to say, listen, if there is love for you, there's love for them. Maybe you could be that messenger here today or in this week or the months ahead as you pray and discern so that others can say, you know what? As those people that I know who love Jesus, they don't just talk the talk, they walk the walk. They don't just go to church on Sunday professing a faith in the love of Jesus Christ living in their heart and soul. And then the other six days of the week, they live a different kind of lifestyle. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be perfect. I say this all the time. Don't be perfect, but follow the one who is. You can strive towards perfection. But at every single day, we're going to fall short. We're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes. But when you mess up and you make a mistake, that part of not easily angered, own it. If you get angry, own it. Now, don't continue to be angry, but own it in a way you say, you know what? I got angry. My fuse has gotten really short. I didn't sleep well. I'm just frustrated about this mask mandate, not mask mandate. Get this vaccine, not get that vaccine. The, the division of this country. You get angry and you get frustrated and just say, God, forgive me. Everyone that you got angry with, go to them and say, I'm so sorry I got angry. I need to work on that. I need to spend more time in prayer. Will you please forgive me? And in that saying, I'm sorry, and asking for forgiveness is an extension of God's love. Did you hear that every Sunday we're now singing, Jesus loves me? It's not just for the children to come down at children's time, but it's for us to say over and over again that no matter how old we are, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. It's something that we're going to do every Sunday as a reminder to all of us that we should probably sing that every day, shouldn't we? Wouldn't your life change and change your whole perspective in understanding that God loves you through his son, Jesus? And just as Jesus takes these children in the Bible, describing of Jesus letting the little children come to me, him taking them up into his arms, that's what Jesus wants to do with you every single day of your life. But he wants us to take this love and go out beyond the walls of the church to tell others that love that God offers is agape, unconditional love, and that love never ends. The question is, today, do you receive it? Do you welcome it into your heart and your soul? And Jesus is waiting for your response. You see, Jesus can't kick down the door to your heart. I wish he could. Wouldn't that be great? Because Jesus would just be kicking doors down all day long. But you have the free will to open the door or just ignore it. How many people are just ignoring that knock? And Jesus continues to knock on the door and continues to try to reach in through the door and say, Hey, Mike, I love you. And you're like, stop it. I don't love myself. Can you imagine that angry conversation? Going, I know that. That's why I love you even more today. And I love you and I love you and I love you. And I hope and pray that you hear that message today for yourself. But when that love comes into your heart and your soul and you open that door through the free will that you have to receive it today, I hope that you feel that emptiness inside is being filled. And through that love and that anointing as a child of God, that cup overflows. We read Psalm 23 yesterday here at the service for Jackie. Jackie lived that out. Her cup overflowed with the love of Jesus. And we are all blessed to know Jackie in the love of Jesus that she lived out in her life. Did Jackie ever get to a point where like, okay, that's enough love. We should never ever say we have enough love. We should want to have more and more love to share beyond the walls of this church so that others, when they drive by this church or when others get to come to this church for worship or connect with us online, they drive by and they say, that church 
has an authentic love of Jesus. They don't just talk the talk, they live it out. I've read 1 Corinthians 13, and that church is not just a clanging symbol. That church lives out the love of Jesus. The question is, will we all choose that today to be a part of it? To be the body of Christ redeemed in his blood and to know of his unconditional love. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you and we praise you for this message you have given us this day. As you speak to each and every one of your children here today, may we have that love that is unconditional, that agape love. And may it be intertwined with our faith and our hope, forever connected with you. And may we find ways to be your hands and your feet out in this world so that we can allow others to see the love of Jesus living in us through our words and our actions. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please stand for our closing hymn? It is, O Master, let me walk with thee. And if you'd like to come down for a time of prayer, I would be welcome to meet you. May you go today through the power of the Holy Spirit with the love that God offers through his son, Jesus. What kind of love? Agape love, an unconditional love that I pray that would forever live in your heart and your soul, forever overflow in all aspects of your life. That when people want to see the love of Jesus, they see you see in all aspects of your life of living out the scripture of 1 Corinthians 13 and that you would forever be tied together with a knot that can never be untied with faith, hope, and love and the love of Jesus. We pray all these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all of God's children said Amen.
Yes.